but I just realized you couldn't hear anything that I said. We're in chapter 13. <laughs> Jerry, Jerry, we've just had technical difficulties left and right today. I apologize. Chapter 13, forget that first couple of minutes there, and we're going to just pick up in chapter 13. You missed my wonderful introduction leading up to it, and I will apologize for that. Chapter 13, the first three verses. Um, again, now there were at Antioch in the church that was there prophets and teachers, Barnabas and Simeon, who was called Niger, and Lucius, or Lucius of Cyrene and Manian, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. While they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then, when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. Again, in chapter 11, we noticed how special this church in Antioch was and how they were the first church the first group of Christians to really reach out to the Gentiles in an effort to convert them to the good news. Now, from this church, the gospel is going to advance across, really, the entire Roman Empire, or at least everything that's in their control at uh, this time. Verse 1 opens up, and we have this list of five men who have been identified as prophets and teachers. Uh, they're there and they're teaching people, they're informing people about the good news, but more than just that, they're, are going, they're, they're going to be evangelistic in nature. They want to get the gospel out just as far as they can. Uh, after listing then these workers in the church there, Luke records for us in verse 2 and 3, the Spirit's instructions for evangelism uh, or evangelistic work beyond the borders of Antioch. Uh, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work that I have called them to do. Before they left, the church there spent some time fasting and praying then, the text says. Uh, they were taking the time to beseech God, make sure His blessings were uh, upon this mission that they are going to be undertaking. And the importance of that, the view that they are the way we know they saw that as important was that their prayer was um, very intense as it was accompanied with this fasting as well. Uh, the text says they were laying their hands on them. And we see that phrase a couple of different times uh, in the book of Acts. On, on one hand, whenever Peter went to the people in Samaria and laid his hands on them, he did so to bestow uh, gifts of the Spirit to them. The other use of laying on of hands may just simply be uh, an embrace, embracing them uh, to encourage them as they're going out on this journey or recognizing what the Spirit has said. Well, after this is done then, Barnabas and Saul, they are ready to go. In verse 4, So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. This they, of course, is going to be Barnabas and Paul, and we're going to come to find out just a little bit later. Uh, John Mark, who has traveled from Jerusalem to Antioch with them, he is going to be traveling with them on this occasion as well. Uh, we continue on, we see uh, them landing on Cyprus, and then they're going to go to a couple of places there in Cyprus, Salamis and Paphos. Uh, continue, if you will, please, in verse 5. When they reached Salamis, they began to proclaim the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they also had John as their helper. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they found a magician, a Jewish false prophet, also, whose name was Bargesus, Bar who was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence. This man summoned Barnabas and Saul and, Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elamus, the magician, for so his name is translated, was opposing them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who was also known as Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, fixed his gaze on him and said, You who are full of all deceit and fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease to make crooked the straight ways of the Lord? 
Now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and not see the sun for a time. And immediately a mist with a darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking those who would lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw all that had happened, being amazed at the teaching of the Lord. Salamis was uh, a metropolitan post or port on the eastern end of Cyprus. Uh, it was really the commercial center of the island, and it had a large Jewish population as well, uh, and also would have a number of Jewish synagogues that would have been located there also. Uh, preaching first in the synagogues, that is going to be a pattern that we're going to see develop as Paul is traveling to all the different cities that he goes to. Uh, this fits in with what he's going to tell the brethren of Rome in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. When he talks about the power of the gospel that he's not ashamed of, uh, he says, For I'm not ashamed of the power of gospel, for... You know, that's what happens sometimes, Jerry. You, you start to quote a passage, and all of a sudden, yeah. your, your mind goes blank. <laughs> he says, For... For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. And that, what Paul says there to the brethren of Rome, really serves as his mission statement, his goal for how he goes about his teaching efforts. He starts there with the Jews in the cities that he goes to, and then from then, when he's rejected by them, he goes to the Gentiles. And we'll see more of that as we continue on, uh, Lord willing, this afternoon. So they traverse this entire island. It's going to be around 90 or more miles. Yet, during this journey, it's really interesting to me anyway, that Luke does not record for us any success that they may have had. Uh, so far, we have a, a fair amount of success uh, along with the toils that take place. We see success in Samaria. We see success with Cornelius and his family. We see success in Antioch. Uh, now that Paul and Barnabas have left Antioch to go down to Cyprus, Luke doesn't record any success for us. What's, what's going on? He's traveled so far across this island, and yet... No one is listening. No one has uh, come to know God through their work, per perhaps. But finally, they reach Paphos, which would be on the western side of this island. And Paphos is going to be the capital of Cyprus. And it's also going to be the residence of the imperial proconsul. It is here that they find this magician, uh, Bargesus, or uh, Elymas, as his name is also translated. Uh, what's interesting, he's a Jewish magician. That's really interesting because the Old Testament warned against sorcery and such things like that. Uh, so why has he gone off in this direction? Those are just things we don't know. We do know, though, he is described as a false prophet, and that's what we need to know about this guy. Uh, he's one of these guys that will tell you what you want to hear, not necessarily the truth. That's going to be played out here, and he's going to be rebuked for that. Uh, this magician was with the proconsul. And Luke, being the very descriptive person that he is when he writes, he is very detailed. He tells us who this proconsul is. His name is Sergius Paulus. He's a man of intelligence. And when he hears that Paul and Barnabas are in town, he wants to uh, meet them. He wants to listen to them. He wants to perhaps see a miracle or, or hear the word of God. Now, Bar-Jesus knew that Sergius Paulus uh, accepted, or F. Sergius Paulus accepted the message of the Messiah, that his influence uh, with the proconsul it would be all but gone. And so he didn't want that to happen, obviously. He's going to continue to interrupt Paul and Barnabas and uh, dissuade them from speaking. Uh, he's actively attempting to keep the proconsul from accepting the things that are taught. And so what does Paul do? He calls him out. 
in very descriptive language. You know, this idea of be careful how you word things. You don't want to offend people. Yes, you need to say the right thing, but you need to focus more on saying it in the right way. Well, sometimes you just have to call a snake a snake. And that's what Paul does here. Did you catch the things that he said in verse 10? You who are full of deceit and fraud. He doesn't say, you who need to be taught better because you don't have all the truth. No, that's not what he says. Uh, He doesn't tell him, hey, I'm really concerned that Satan has you within his grasp. He just flat out calls him, you son of the devil. You enemy of unrighteousness. Will you not cease to make crooked the straight ways of the Lord? That's strong language. Some would say we shouldn't use such as Paul was inspired. Well, we can't strike a man blind as he did. But one thing we can do, we can speak boldly. When we hide behind God's word, we should have no fear of speaking boldly. And that's what Saul does here. For people who would say that would just turn people off, well, is that what happened here? Did the pro council say, you know, Paul, you would have convinced me if it hadn't have been for your attitude? No, that's not the result at all. Actually, the result is that the proconsul believed and he was amazed at the teaching of the Lord. They leave here and they go on to Perga in verse 13. When making the jump from Paphos to uh, Pergia in Pamphylia, the trio now becomes a duo. And this is going to be significant. We're not told at this point exactly why John Mark leaves. We're going to save that for uh, a a lesson later on whenever we are, uh, uh, we we see Barnabas wanting to take him back. But John Mark leaves and he returns to Jerusalem. Now, yes, Later indications will be that this was a result of fear. But we know that it greatly upset Paul. It really hurt him. John Mark pledged to go on this trip. And no doubt there were warning signs all over the place. This was going to be a dangerous thing. People are not going to want us to do the things that we're going to do. They're not going to want us to say the things that need to be said. But we as followers of Christ, we have to say them. Our duty is to get out and teach the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ to those people who are lost and dying in their sin. That's what Paul did. And at the very beginning of this almost, John Mark is going to see just how bad it is and he is going to return to Jerusalem. Now, we will find out later more about all of this. Whenever Barnabas wants to take John Mark, he can give him a second chance. Paul has no use for him at that moment. But it is significant in 2 Timothy chapter 4, as Paul is getting toward the end of his life, and he knew that. And he he, he tells Timothy, I fought the good fight, I finished the course. He's going to go on and tell Timothy to bring John Mark with him, in appealing to Timothy to come before winter and bring his cloak and the parchments. He also wants to see John Mark. All of a sudden, John Mark is useful to him again. I believe that is going to tell us something very important. One mistake does not a man make. John Mark has made a serious mistake here. And... Paul is going to go on and not use him in journeys or in his next uh, journey. And he has a pretty good reason for that, because he can't trust him. 
But over time, John Mark proves himself to be trustworthy and reliable. And Paul realizes that. John Mark is the kind of guy we all are if we're honest with ourselves and honest with the Lord. We can be fearful sometimes. We'll set our hand out to the plow, we'll get to work, and then all of a sudden we haven't counted the cost the way that we should. We'll get scared and we'll, we'll turn back. But then when we realize, as Paul told Timothy, God hasn't given us a spirit of timidity, but one of strength and power, recognizing what we have done. The goal for us is to get back up and get back to work harder than we ever have. And that's exactly what John Mark is going to end up doing. Well, let's move on from Perga and let's get to another town called Antioch. This Antioch is not going to be in Syria. It's going to be in a place called Pisidia. And let's just go ahead and take the time to read a little bit of the text beginning in verse 14. Now going on from Perga, they arrived at Pisidian Antioch, and on the Sabbath day they went into the synagogue and sat down. After reading of the law and the prophets, the synagogue officials sent to them, saying, Brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say it. Paul stood up and motioning with his hand said, Men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. The God of this people, listen, or the God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt, and with an uplifted arm he led them out from it. For a period of about forty years he put up with them in the wilderness. When he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he distributed their land as an inheritance, all of which took about four hundred and fifty years. After these things, he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. Then he asked for a king, and God gave them Saul the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for forty years. After he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, concerning whom he also testified and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who will do all my will. From the descendants of this man, according to promise, God has brought to Israel a Savior, Jesus. After John had proclaimed before his coming a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel, and while John was completing his course, he kept saying, What do you suppose that I am? I am not he, but behold, one is coming after me, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. Brethren, sons of Abraham's family and those among you who fear God, to listen to the message of this salvation, uh, to us the, the message of this salvation has been sent. For those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, recognizing neither him nor the utterances of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled these by condemning him. And though they, put, they, found, though they found no ground for putting him to death, they asked Pilate that he be executed. When they had carried out all that was written concerning him, they took him down from the cross and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. And for many days he appeared to those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, the very ones who are now his witnesses to the people. And we preach to you the good news of the promise made to the fathers that God has fulfilled this promise to our children in that he raised up Jesus. As it is also written in the second psalm, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As for the fact that he raised him up from the dead no longer to return in decay, he has spoken in this way, I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. Therefore, he also says in another psalm, you will not allow your Holy One to undergo decay. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid among his fathers and underwent decay. But he whom God raised did not undergo decay. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through him forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And through him everyone who believes is freed from all things, from which... 
you could not be freed through the law of Moses. Therefore take heed, so that the things spoken of in the prophets may not come upon you. Behold, you scoffers, and marvel and perish, for I am accomplishing a work in your days, a work which you will never believe, though someone should describe it to you. As Paul and Barnabas were going out, the people kept begging that these things might be spoken to them the next Sabbath. Now when the meeting of the synagogue had broken up, many of the Jews and of the God-fearing proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, were urging them to continue in the grace of God. And we'll pause there just for a few moments, and we'll pick up what happens on the next Sabbath. Although disappointed in John Mark, Paul and Barnabas, they were not going to quit. They had a job to do, a job that they were committed to, and that's exactly what they were going to fulfill. And they decided to move inland to the chief city in the Roman province of Galatia. Some would say this is uh, the most treacherous territory in the world at this time, and, and we will see later why, by the way, in the next chapter, in chapter 14. Uh, this may have been the place that Paul had in mind when he spoke of the dangers uh, he faced in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, when he talked about all the perils that he would suffer for the sake of the Lord and for his willingness to go out and teach, uh, being in danger of robbers and, and thieves, in danger for his life. Perhaps it was this area of the world that he was thinking about. Uh, so on the first Sabbath, after arriving there in uh, Antioch of Pisidia, Paul and Barnabas, they, they do what they do. They make their way to the synagogue where the Jews are going to be gathered. They were given the opportunity on this occasion to speak to all who were gathered there. Did you see how they did that? After the reading of the law and the prophets, the synagogue officials sent to them, Brethren, if you have a word of exhortation for the people, say it. Uh, that's like any preacher be, being asked, Preacher, what does the Bible say? You know, I, I don't know many preachers who wouldn't jump on that opportunity to speak to a bunch of people who perhaps don't know or don't believe in the Bible when given that opportunity. So Paul does what preachers do. He, he speaks. And we have this long discourse here, uh, beginning here in verse fi uh, 16, going down through verse 41. It's interesting how his sermon goes. Uh, he begins with the admonition, If you fear God, listen to me. What, what, what a great way to start a sermon, Jerry. <laughs> if you fear God, I have something for you. You need to listen. And that's, that's going to be that attention grabber. Everybody's going to turn and, well, hey, we're here because we fear God, so okay, we're going to listen to you. And then he begins with a common knowledge. Now, these people who are going to be in Antioch of Pisidia, the Jews that are there, they are going to be some of the uh, uh, d diaspora, some of those Jews who have been uh, dispersed across the Roman Empire for various reasons, whether it is um, uh, economic reasons or, or forced reasons, whatever reason. They, they have been dispersed all over the Roman Empire for one reason or another. But though they haven't been in Jerusalem, we don't know how long it had been since they had been in Jerusalem or received word from Jerusalem, we do know that they would have that common ancestry and they would have knowledge of the events that happened so long ago. And so Paul begins his sermon by reminding them of things that they already know. He talks about how God protected and provided in Egypt how God was there, how he guided uh, the people to Israel. He preserved Egypt, kind of uh, served as an incubator for the people of God. And then at the right time, uh, he leads the people out of Egypt, and they go out boldly, uh, Exodus chapter 14, as they march out of Egypt, a much larger and much more prosperous nation than they were when they uh, started as they start, uh, moved into Egypt so long ago. But 
because of sin and because of obstinance, they had to wander in the wilderness for 40 years, verse 17 and 18. And then, verse 19, they take the land. God goes before them, and, and they are able to take the land. They cried out for a leader. In verse 20, Paul reminds them of the judges. You'll remember Othniel, Ehud, Shamgar, Deborah, Gideon, Abimelech, Tola, Jer, Jephthah, Ibzan, Elon, Abdon, Samson, Eli, all the way up to Samuel. And then they cried out for a king yet again. And God gave them Saul, wanting to be like the nations around them. God then removes Saul. And he sets David on the throne. This is going to be something that they're going to all be familiar with. They're also then going to be familiar with the promise made of David's heir. From uh, David's seed, there is going to come a king who is going to sit on the throne of David uh, perpetually, for forever. And from David's lineage, Jesus, the Savior, was born. Uh, here he tells them, John the Baptist prepared the way. And so these people uh, would have heard, perhaps, of what John was preaching back in Jerusalem. Uh, they would have heard about this, this Jesus who came on the scene and uh, who died, who was crucified back in Jerusalem. The point in all of this, though, is that the message of salvation is here. The Messiah of promise, he is coming to this earth. And he is now here. He was rejected, though. He was delivered to Pilate, verse uh, 27 and 28. And then he died on the cross, verse 29 and 31. Uh, an extremely concise, but a complete picture of the history of the, uh, of the Jewish nation all the way up to the Messiah of promise, suffering and dying exactly as was prophesied about. He died on the cross, but God raised him up. And then in verse 32, And we preach to you the good news of the promise made to the fathers. And so here he ties it all together. You'll remember the Abrahamic promise, In your seed all nations of the earth will be blessed. Through Jesus Christ, that promise is going to be fulfilled to all people of the earth, whether Jew or Gentile. All nations of the earth will be blessed. And Paul is saying, this is why we're here. We're here to proclaim this good news that there is salvation for all men in Jesus Christ. But he goes a step further. After giving the first half of his sermon the history of the Jewish people leading up to Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, now he is going to offer some proofs. He's going to go back to those scriptures that they hold as inspired and valuable, and he is going to prove what he is saying. He does so by turning to the Psalms. He gives that proof from the Psalms there, beginning in verse 33 all the way through verse 37. And then he ends, verse 38 through 41, with another call. Listen to us. The things that we are saying to you are important. Verse 40, therefore take heed. Why? So that the things spoken of in the prophets may not come upon you. And then he quotes, Behold, you scoffers, and marvel and perish, for I am accomplishing a work in your days, a work which you will never believe, though someone should describe it to you. Paul is saying, I'm describing it to you. I've described all of these things that have happened. Are you going to be like the ones the prophet is talking about? Or are you going to take heed, listen, and act? You see, Paul He's calling them to make a decision. He's calling on them to act. Paul ends his sermon here, and he and Barnabas, they're going to leave, but a group says, hey, no, wait, 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 stick around. We want to hear this again. We want to hear more, verse uh, 42 and 43, but let's pick back up with our text in verse 44. The next Sabbath, nearly the whole assembly or the whole city, excuse me, assembled to hear the word of God. 
or the word of the Lord. So before it wasn't the whole city, obviously it was, it was the people who would have been there in the synagogue, but now the news of what was said last Sabbath in the synagogue is starting to percolate through the entire population. And now everybody's going to come out. We want to all hear the things that are going to be said. There's excitement there. Tell me about this good news. Tell me about salvation in Jesus Christ. But the Jews. They were going to fulfill the prophet and the words that he spoke. They weren't going to believe, despite how clear Paul was with his explanation. Verse 45. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began contradicting the things spoken by Paul and were blaspheming. Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly and said, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first, since you repudiate it and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, I have placed you as a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the end of the earth. Again, think about just how bold the reaction is here. You see, they have a mission, a divine mission. They have a job to do, and that is to teach people the good news of salvation and not let anyone or anything stop them. All the people from the city, they come out to hear them. And it, it does to the Jews what happened in Jerusalem and some of the Jews there. They were jealous of Jesus. They were jealous of the following that he was having. And so being jealous, they, they began to do all sorts of things to argue and to, to fight, to repudiate the text, Luke even tells us that they were guilty of blasphemy. They, they, they were resorting to blasphemy to shut Paul and Barnabas down, to keep people from listening. And Paul and Barnabas, they remind them, look, it was necessary for us to start here. This is, this is, this is where we were told to start. Salvation is from the Jews, but it's going unto all the earth. And that's exactly what we're going to do. Since you repudiated. And notice what he says. In their repudiation of the things that he's saying, they are judging themselves unworthy of eternal life. That idea of judgment, judgment and passing judgment on people. As a preacher of the gospel, when you you preach something that people don't like to hear, one of the things that they're going to say and, and accuse is you're being judgmental. That's just your judgment, they may say. Well, when we're reading from the Bible and we're telling you exactly what God says, it's, it's, first of all, it's not our judgment. It's God's. And that is a judgment that is infallible. And second, the only judgment that's taken place is that when you don't listen to the things that God has said, you are judging yourself unworthy of eternal life. Are you worthy of eternal life? Well, on, on one hand, none of us would say that we are. None of us would say, uh, yes, yes, I, I, I'm, I'm worth Jesus dying for. Not, none of us would be so, so bold or so arrogant. But Jesus did die for us all. And so are you going to just let that be in vain? Or are you going to do something about it? Are you going to accept that gift of grace? Or are you going to sit there 
I'm unworthy of accepting even this grace and condemn your own soul. That's what the Jews are doing here on this occasion. And so as a result, uh, Paul says, I'm going to the Gentiles. We are turning to them. And what does this do? As he talks about why he is going to them, because I'm going to bring salvation, as the Lord said, even to the ends of the earth. And what does this cause? It causes great rejoicing. The Gentiles are excited. Verse 48, when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was being uh, spread through the whole region. But the Jews incited the devout women of prominence and the leading men of the city and instigated a persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district. But they shook off the dust of their feet and protest against them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were continually filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Notice, as we get ready to wind things down today, the results of Paul's work in Antioch. First, the Gentiles, they, they rejoice. They rejoice in the Lord. And they glorify God. They appreciate the gift of grace that is being bestowed upon them, and they want to accept it. They, they want to devote their lives to the Lord. And that's what we see them doing here. Second, a result of this is that the word of the Lord is going to spread through the entire region. You can kick Paul and Barnabas out of Antioch, But throughout the region surrounding Antioch, the word of God is going to continue to expand. It is going to continue to touch people's lives. Third, important women and leading men get riled up to start this persecution of Paul and Barnabas. But they shake the dust off their feet. And they went on to the next city. They go on down to Iconium. And then the disciples are continually filled with joy and the Spirit. Their passion has not been diminished in any way. They are doing the things that God has told them to do. And they are receiving the things that were warned would happen. Because when we follow the Lord, when we devote our lives to Him, we will be persecuted. All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. But they don't let that stop them. They keep working. They keep spreading this message, this good news of salvation. It was important to them, this message was important to them, so important that they were willing to do whatever it takes to take this message to whoever would listen. And you know what? If you won't listen to me, I'm going to somebody else. I'm not going to waste my time with the people who are just going to turn their backs to me. I'm going to go find people who will listen, find people who want to learn about God and want to learn about the grace of God so that they can come in to know God. And that's what Paul and Barnabas do. And they serve as a tremendous example of Christians who will do whatever it takes to fulfill the mission God has given them. Now, that's going to be put to the test yet again because in the next chapter, Lord willing, Wednesday, Jerry will unpack chapter 14 for us and we're going to see all of the difficulties that are going to now be faced uh, by Paul and Barnabas in Lystra, Derby and Iconium. And we'll find them to be tremendous. Very, very early in Paul's ministry, it could have all ended abruptly, painfully, and quick. But Paul, he's going to keep going because that's who Paul is. And so he would write to the brethren of Corinth later on, Be imitators of me, as I am of Christ. Of course, Jesus Christ was the one who would be persecuted, the one who would be beaten down, the one who would be killed. 
but nothing would stop him, not even the grave. And for Paul, his attitude was the same. Nothing is going to stop me from doing the job God has given me to do. And he admonishes those readers, you be the same way. Preach the message. Get the good news of salvation out to the people who are lost. They need to hear this. Do it with passion. Do it with boldness. Do it with clarity. So that we can snatch some souls away from the grip of Satan. Well, thank you so much for being with us this afternoon. Sorry, so sorry about the technical difficulties that uh, got me a little bit flustered at the uh, beginning of our program, but uh, hopefully we got things put together so that uh, chapter 13 could come to you in a pretty clear way. Let's uh, end with a word of prayer before we get out of here. Uh, Will you bow with me, please? Dear Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the ways that you bless our lives. We're so thankful that we can read your word and that we can learn about the men who served you so diligently. Lord, help us to look to people like Paul and Barnabas as examples, illustrations of how you would have your people live still to this day. Help us, dear Lord, to be on fire for you to be ready to teach, to be ready to preach, to be willing to endure suffering and persecution, not to bring glory to ourselves, but only to bring glory to you. Lord, help us glorify you and give you the honor that you were due. Forgive us when we fail you, but Lord, save us in the end. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.